Acts chapter number 2 tonight, Acts chapter number 2. We're going to begin by reading one verse, but then we're going to look at the backstory uh, for this verse as we continue our series on seven lessons from committed Christians. And uh, it's a challenge for us to move from casual Christianity to a committed Christianity. We have a lot of people that are dedicated casually. Now, those are almost oxymorons because either you're dedicated or you're casual, but a lot of times people will claim to be dedicated to things, but really they're dedicated to those things when it's convenient, when it's comfortable. In sports, as we've talked before, we call those bandwagon fans. But when the seasons are rough, it's like forget those teams, you know, and that's how we are sometimes not only in sports, which in sports, and I know this is hard for some of us to gather sometimes, sports in the long run doesn't really matter that much. I mean, if your team lost last year, it didn't really or shouldn't have changed your life that much. You ever notice that? When your team wins or loses, it messes with your attitude, but it doesn't really change your life. Your bank account doesn't get bigger when they win. It doesn't get smaller when they lose unless you're gambling, and that's another thing that we need to talk about, you know. The weather isn't based on if your team wins. Your relationships shouldn't be based on if your team wins. Because in the long run, sports doesn't have necessarily a lasting impact. I understand when you play sports, you learn lessons and disciplines. But overall, those victories or losses don't have major impacts. In our life, however, in our relationships, in our homes, in our churches, the difference between being a casual Christian and a committed Christian can make the difference. If we are living in honor to Christ, we will be the right employee, we'll be the right uh, friend, we'll be the right Christian. So we're going to look tonight at this verse, verse number one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Tonight I want us to talk about unity, looking at this being in one accord in one place. And let's pray to me, Father, Lord. I pray that you will focus my mind and my heart as I, uh, Lord, attempt to teach your word. And I pray to the Lord that our hearts will be open and that, Lord, we won't simply take what we hear tonight and think of everyone else, but, Lord, we'll apply it into our own lives. And, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A question we could ask is, how does a committed Christian promote or advocate for Christian unity or unity within the body of Christ? Now, one of the things I think is very important for us to understand is that it is a unity in the body of Christ. We are unified around the things of Christ. Sometimes people have this idea that if you're unified as a Christian, then you can't disagree with anyone. Now, that's first off wrong. You can even disagree within the body of Christ on what I would call non-black and white things in the Bible, things that aren't that are very clear. I guess we should say black, white, and red, because some of the words are in red, depending on if you have a red letter edition. But some things that are unclear, we can disagree on. We can have different styles and that sort of thing. But I can't disagree on salvation with you and be unified with you. I can't disagree on if Jesus is God and be unified with you. But in the doctrines of the Bible, we are to be unified one with another. Now, the reason why it's within the body of Christ is, as I would say, the world or culture isn't built on the things of Christ. Our nation it was built on a lot of biblical principles, but we can look across our nation today and see the guiding force is not the Bible. It's not even the Constitution today. We live in a society where they lived, and this isn't new, they lived this way in the book of Judges where every man does right in his own eyes. We can't be unified around that, and here's why. There's nothing to unify around. If you do what's right in your eyes, and I do what's right in my eyes, and the person next to you does what's right in their eyes, we're going to all be doing different things. So how can we be unified around those things? We can, but you know what we can be unified around? The Word of God. The Word of God doesn't change. The Bible that I have in my, my, on the pulpit, actually not in my hand, but on the pulpit is the same Bible you have in your lap. Why can we be unified? Because we're unified around Christ. As we look at this text this evening, the Bible tells us in verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, notice this, they were all with one accord in one place. I want to focus on that being in one accord. Now, you know this. 
you get a bunch of people together, you know what you're going to have? Different opinions. You're going to have disagreements if you, if you stay there for longer. But when we look at this, this group of people, they had been together in one place, actually, for a while. In fact, as we look at this place, they had been 120 people for 10 days together. Can you imagine having 120 people in one place for 10 days? You know, one of the reasons why church on Sunday goes so well and we don't have a bunch of arguments, because we're there for about two hours. That's on a long day, an hour in a lot of cases. And then we have a break and come back later <laughs> and we're around each other. I promise you this, because of our flesh, it would be very easy if we stayed all together in one place for an extended period of time to allow this disunity to creep in. But we notice in this text that we look at, after 10 days, they were in with one accord. They were unified in one place. Now, as we look at this tonight, I want us to look at this question then. How were these Christians, who were committed Christians for sure, how were they able to do this? The first thing I want you to notice this is they had a common commitment to Christ. It had been uh, 10 days now, 120 of them had waited in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you got saved and when I got saved, because we're on this side of the story we're looking at tonight, the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in. But there was a period of time where Jesus had gone away, Acts chapter 1, Jesus had gone away, and they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. When Jesus was here on earth, the Holy, they didn't need the Holy Spirit with them. Jesus was with them. But then, remember John chapter 14, he says, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send a comforter to come. That was the Holy Spirit. They were waiting on the Holy Spirit to come. For 10 days, they had prayed. It's, un, it's important to understand this, though. Not everybody who had met the Lord after he resurrected were committed to the same thing. You ever find yourself getting discouraged in life because people who come to know Christ as their Savior had walked away? Have you ever had those where you think they, they should come to know the Savior as, as their Savior, but they don't accept it? And sometimes you'll walk away from that feeling like, man, I just must be a terrible Christian. I think everybody who has been saved has probably felt that at some point. Somebody leaves the church, and you think it's your fault because you couldn't keep them there. Sometimes we almost have that feeling like it's our responsibility to keep people at church. Now, it is our responsibility not to run them off. <laughs> now, sometimes, if we're honest, we might do that. It is our responsibility, but we have this almost idea that we're supposed to keep them here. Or this idea that everybody we talk to and present the gospel to, they should get saved. And if they don't, we must have done something wrong. Do you know what I find comfort in the scripture? Do you realize over 500 people saw the risen Savior after he resurrected from the grave before he ascended into heaven? Over 500 people saw them, but that night there were only 120 there. We're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. They weren't all there. But the group that was there was unified around this Christ. By the way, on the salvation side, everybody Jesus saw didn't get saved. There were people that he had conversations with, people that he taught. And you know what Jesus said to his disciples after they all walked away? Will ye also go away? You realize Jesus at time had thousands following him? Remember the feeding of the 5,000? People have estimated there may have been as many as 25,000 people there. And the reason for that is because it says there were 5,000 men. And often in those days, you'll notice in the scripture, they didn't always give the number of the children and the women who may have been there. But there's at least 5,000. Do you realize Jesus went from 5,000 following him to only 11 being with him? Now, I don't say that as an excuse. I say that as reality. Sometimes people go away. But here we have 
the remainers, I would call them. 120 people who are dedicated, dedicated to waiting for the Holy Spirit. Now, you know something else we don't like to do? We don't like to wait. That's the society that we live in. I struggle with this thing called patience. And if you're honest, you probably do too. And I'm going to tell you why. It's not natural for our flesh to be patient. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. But these people weren't only together, they were waiting. There are those who today, despite having a relationship with Christ, they're not part of that 120 who are willing to be committed around Jesus Christ. You see, the strength of the church's fellowship with one another is directly related to the strength of the church member's commitment to Jesus Christ. Because you see, as a church, if we're only committed to what we enjoy, then we're committed to the wrong thing. I'll be honest with you, a lot of times if we're not careful, uh, we'll notice other people do this, but if we're not careful, we can fall in this trap too. We go to church because we enjoy it. In fact, people will often pick churches based on what they enjoy as opposed to being committed to Christ. That's why people who know what the Bible teaches will be willing to go to places that don't teach the Bible because their commitment is not to Christ. Their commitment is to, honestly, themselves and their enjoyment. But these people, they were committed to Christ. These people were committed to Christ. Therefore, they were all of one mind. They were all of one accord in one place. You know, one of the keys to being in one accord in one place is Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice it didn't say let these minds be in you. Let this mind be in you. See, we have one person that we are unified around, and it's no other person than Jesus Christ. By the way, you can't substitute anybody in for Jesus Christ. Sometimes if you're not careful, people will want to substitute someone else, whether it be the preacher or some celebrity or some fill-in-the-blank, whatever it may be, for Jesus Christ to be, to be committed to. But understand this, our commitment is not to people. Our commitment is to Christ. Therefore, if that person goes away from Christ, our, our following of them also goes away. And when they're, and, and, and sometimes people make mistakes and so forth, and so you don't support them in that as they go away from Christ. The reality is this, our, our ability to be unified and our promoting of unification is around one thing, and it's Jesus Christ. There is no other document that you can substitute or put on the same plane as the Word of God. There's no person that you can substitute or elevate to the place of Jesus Christ. I like the verse that God has given him a name that's above every name. There's no name equal with the name of Christ. And so as a committed Christian, we advocate for unity around the person, Jesus Christ. Secondly, not only were they committed to Christ, but they also had a common commitment to love one another. Now you say, how in the world do you come up with the fact that they were committed to love one another? I'll tell you why. There was 120 people for 10 days in close quarters. Do you know what it takes to survive 10 days with 120 people in close quarters? Love. You know the verse, love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that's not the idea that love covers up sins. That's not what it's, it's not talking about when someone sins, don't deal with it, just put it under the rug. Because eventually, your rug is going to be taller than the floor. Because it's got so much sin under it. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of times that's what happens. People sweep sin under the rug, and then after a while, it, people start to notice. Something's not right here. Before you know it, you know what they do? They do what you do at home when stuff gets under the rug. You pull it back, and when you pull it back, you find what you didn't want to find. Now, you've probably done it. If you've had kids, you've done it at the house. A banana, who puts a banana under the rug? You know, anyway, that's just what happens, right? That's just the truth. And the truth is that verse, love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't mean love covers up a multitude of sins. It means that love can forgive a multitude of sins. You ever heard, you know, maybe somebody took care of something for you. Maybe they bought a meal for you and they're like, hey, I need to pay you back. And they're like, no, 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 that's fine. I got it covered. That doesn't mean they covered it up. Shh. 
don't tell anybody he ate at the buffet because we're not paying for it. That's not what it's talking about. No, it's covered. They took care of it. And the reality is, among Christians, we're going to wrong each other. It's going to happen. But you know what love does? Love covers the multitude of sins. Do you know what love says? I know you're not perfect, and we're going to be okay. And by the way, you better have that attitude, because guess what? You're not either. And oftentimes, if we're not careful, instead of being loving one to another, we become judging one of another. And you know what we often want to do? We want to judge others, but we don't want to be judged. That's why the Bible says, judge not, lest ye be judged. It goes on to say, with the same judgment you judge, you will be judged. Can I tell you this? When I need mercy, I sure do hope that I've extended it. And when I need grace, I sure hope that I have extended grace. You know why? Because it's not, it's, it's not if, but when we fail one another. That's just the truth of life. And so as we look at this, this group of people, the early disciples... They, they, they had love one for another. By the way, do you know what they also knew? They also knew that they were all equally in need of the Holy Spirit. Every one of them needed the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you tonight, all of us need the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. You know, I think about sometimes if we're not careful, we'll go to church and we think, Lord, Holy Spirit, get a hold of that preacher. But in reality, our prayer should be, Holy Spirit, get a hold of that preacher so that the preacher preaches to us what we need to hear but it also ought to be Holy Spirit, get a hold of me, that I may know that I should do what I ought to do. You see, we all need the Holy Spirit. Because as I preach, I need the Holy Spirit to speak through me so that we may hear what we need to hear. But as, as a person, when I'm in the pew, you know what I need? I need the Holy Spirit that he may interpret to me what I need to hear. You know, oftentimes we, uh, we as preachers, we'll talk about how it's interesting how we can preach one message but the Holy Spirit will preach another one to different people. Sometimes you'll preach a message and people get different things out of the message. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit was speaking to them about what they needed. We all equally need the Holy Spirit. We look at the day of Pentecost and we say, wow, look at the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit did. But he didn't just work in the disciples' lives. He worked in the lives of the people that they may hear the gospel and respond to the gospel. Because of this, they had love one for another. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know what I can say with confidence? In those ten days where they were praying for the Holy Spirit, they sinned. They weren't perfect. But you know what they had? Forgiveness. You see, forgiveness isn't extended just because you're out to get something. Forgiveness is extended because God wants you to forgive. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as for, God hath Christ, for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. One writer put it this way, When I become bitter, or unforgiving toward others, I'm assuming that the sins of others are more serious than my sins against God. The cross transforms my perspective. Through the cross, I realize that no sin committed against me will ever be as serious as the innumerable sins I've committed against God. When we understand how much God has forgiven us, it's not difficult to forgive others because we are the most forgiven people in the world. We should be the most forgiving people in the world. You see, this idea of bitterness that the Bible tells us needs to pass away is because, don't you notice this, the, the, I love this statement, is because I'm assuming that the sins of others against me are more serious than my sins against God. You see, I, I don't think we should allow our sins of the past to hold us back. I will say this, we need to understand how terrible our sins against God truly are and were. Do you realize it was my sins that nailed Jesus Christ to the cross? It was your sins, and yet he forgave us. 
Do you know why? Romans 5.8 gives us the answer. But God commended His love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so these believers were able to be unified because they were unified around Christ. They were able to be unified, secondly, because they had love one for another. But then there's a third thing we need to see tonight. They had a common commitment to reach the lost for the cause of Christ. They had a common commitment to reach the lost for the cause of Christ. The 120 tarried in that upper room and they prayed. Now, what do you think they were praying for? Some have said, well, I think they were praying for the Holy Spirit to come. Now, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that that's what they prayed for. I'm going to tell you why. Take your Bibles, turn back a page, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 4 and 5. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus about to speak. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now you say, why do you think they weren't praying with the Holy Spirit? God's already told them it was going to happen. If God's already told you it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And if they were committed enough to wait in a, together, 120 people, for 10 days, I think they believed it was going to happen. So what do you think they prayed for? I believe that they prayed for the task that was set before them. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon ye, on you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They knew the Holy Spirit was coming. I believe they were praying about their mission. They were praying about the job that God had given them to do. He said, listen, the Holy Ghost is coming upon you and you need to be witnesses. And sure enough, they prayed and they planned. And if you read Acts chapter 1, verse 15 through 26, you find that they prayed and they, they, they planned. They were consumed with the idea that theirs was the responsibility to tell the lost the good news of Jesus Christ. They were unified in their mission. They had the same job. Have you ever seen two people that are practically working against each other? One guy's just undoing what the other guy's doing? be honest with you, there's a lot of that that goes on in Christianity. But let me say this, when your commitment is to the mission, a common mission, you're going to get more work done. And what is our mission? To reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were unified in their mission. A committed Christian realizes what matters in a church. Now, how do they know what matters in the church? The Bible tells us what matters in a church. And a lot of time, this lack of unity is because Christians are bickering over things that just aren't biblical in many cases. And they spend all their time, instead of being committed to the mission of the Word of God, they end up trying to read between the lines of the Word of God. Can I tell you this? Until you can keep what's written in the Word of God, quit trying to read between the lines. Just read the Word of God. I heard a clip of a sermon just this week about somebody preaching what's not in the story. Well, don't preach what's not in the story. It's not a story because God didn't want it in there. Not your opinion on this, that, or another. But too often, if we're not careful, that's what we get so consumed with. Instead of getting consumed with what God has told us to do, we get consumed with what's not in the Bible. I mean, that, that's just the truth of the matter, and therefore, we aren't unified around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, that happens in the broad scope of Christianity, but if we're not careful, that can happen within the walls of the church. We get real concerned about things that aren't in the Bible, and then we become divided, because this is what I've learned. It's hard to be divided when you look, well, this is why, because the Bible says right here. You ever notice that? It's hard to argue with what God has said. Now, now I say it's hard to. People will argue with what God has said. I've heard people with my very own ears that say, well, I know the Bible says but. Now that, that word but is called a negatory conjunction that negates what you're about to say is going to negate what you said before that. And that's what happens many times. I know that's what the Bible says, but I think, well, hey, what God says is what matters. And we can get unified around what God says. I'll be honest with you. We can't get unified just around what I think. 
Do you know why? I have lots of thoughts. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of them I found out later weren't even right. You ever had those? By the way, you say, but you're convinced. I've been convinced about some things that later on I realized wasn't even right. But you know what's always right? The perfect Word of God. We as believers can be unified around this. The church, these Christians, do you know about committed Christians? They were Christians in the face of persecution. Do you know what persecution does? Persecution reveals to us what already existed. Our commitments, for instance. They were committed. Why were they committed? How were they committed? They were committed because they were unified around Christ. They were committed because they were unified with love. And they were committed because they were unified with the common mission. If we're going to move from casual Christianity, you know what casual Christianity says? Casual Christianity says, I'll overlook what I want to overlook. Casual Christianity says, you know what, I know it says to be tender-hearted, but I'm having a bad day. Committed Christianity says, I might be having a bad day, but that doesn't mean I have a right to disobey the Word of God. So I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be tender-hearted. I'm going to be forgiven. Why? Because I am forgiven. Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that Jesus... No, he didn't always have good days. Do you think it was a good day when Jesus was hanging on the cross for Jesus? That was his worst day. But do you know what he said while he was on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you know what that is to me? That's an example. It doesn't matter how hard my day is. I have a responsibility to live Christ-like in every situation. Now, that's a hard thing to do. Did you know what the, the Christians here were waiting on? The Holy Spirit. Do you know what we already have dwelling within us? The Holy Spirit. And He's there to help us to be unified, that we can honor Christ.